Um, an important topic this morning, looking at the importance and relevance of, of worship and its role within our lives and its role within the church. Um, before we dive into it, let's up and up and pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your blessing in us that we don't deserve. Thank you for redeeming us through the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ, which we most certainly deserve. But you chose to lavish on us anyway. Help us this morning to keep an open hearts receptive to your word. As we learn about worship, God, and how to return our thanks to you. God, we can never repay. Help us to never have a mindset of we owe, we owe, but we're able to give, God. We're able to give you our praise. We're able to give you everything we have that you've given us so that you may be glorified. Let this truth transform us. God, it help us to see Two of um, my passions and functions here, uh, um, well, in my life and have become so at ABF, have been worship and missions. And surprisingly, there's some interrelation between the two. I gave you a snippet of a quote by John Piper from Let the Nations Be Glad. Now, let me give you the full quote here. Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exists because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. When this age is over and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. It is a temporary necessity, but worship abides forever. We go and tell the news to others so that they know of Christ. They may turn and repent and bring him glory. When it's completed, when Matthew 24, 14 says, the gospel should be preached to all the nations, and then the end will come. When all have heard, all have been redeemed, he'll be glorified through his people. So worship is the ultimate goal. Piper's mindset in this quote can be reflected in the uh, opening of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. So catechism is a uh, series of questions and answers, similar to like we do in some churches before baptism, where there's a um, question and response. Their first question was, um, what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. So that's what we exist for, and I'll mention about that later, as um, mentioned by Scripture. Next section you have of definitions of worship. We look at it in English, it's a combination of two words, worth and ship. Worth meaning something that has value, and ship to ascribe value to something. A state of being worthy, which God is. When we worship, we are showing that someone is worthy. Okay? The Hebrew word is shakah, which is to bow down or to prostrate, to submit oneself to. And in the Greek, which... Um, Jesus, at the time that he was walking on the earth, more than likely used what was called the Septuagint, because Greek was one of the predominant languages of the land. Even though it was the Roman Empire, they had had a Hellenistic view. They had adopted Greek into their culture. That's what I mean by Hellenistic. That Greek was a pervasive language, as was Latin. But um, the Old Testament had been translated into Greek, and it was called the Septuagint. The word used in it for the Old Testament worship was proskuneo which is to kiss the hand or to show reverence, which is not quite the same meaning, but it's still submitting to one's authority, showing reverence and deference to somebody who is greater than you. Now, I've got outlined here the first word or first use of the word worship, that Genesis reference. Without looking it up in 
Can any of you think of what that might be? What would the circumstance the first word time the word was used? Boy and I Abraham about to offer Isaac on that hill. He told his men, stay here with the donkeys. My son and I will go up to worship. Abraham was about to offer his most treasured possession to God because God asked. He trusted God enough that he was willing to give him everything because God had promised him that his line would continue through Isaac. So God knew, or Abraham knew either a sacrifice would be provided or that God could raise him from the dead. But either way, he didn't let doubt stop him and hold him back. So what I want to get at through that is everything we do is an act of worship. It's not so much the songs we sing. Okay, we come in here, we sang two beautiful songs of worship this morning. But if we sing them here, and there's nothing between now and next Sunday that shows we're willing to submit to God, it's been worthless. Worship isn't something we do. It's the only thing that we do. It's been said that God created man in his own image, and man's been returning the favor ever since. If we don't have a right mindset of God and focus our attention on him in truth, we'll find something to worship. Material possessions, other people, even our family, celebrities, we'll find somewhere to focus our affections and our attentions and give glory to them rather than to God. A translation of John Calvin in his Institutes of the Christian Religion says it this way. Man is a perpetual factory of idols. If we don't keep it in check, idols will continually, continually be produced. And even a wrong thought about God is making an idol. Because if we don't have a right thought of God, we're essentially making up a God in our own image that we want to see and we want to agree with. We've talked about the doctrines of grace. So we realize that it's our own sin and our own rebellion by which we merit hell. If we have a mindset or, or we hear somebody say, my God wouldn't send anybody to hell. First, their premise is wrong as what, and to what requires hell. But God would allow some to go to hell. If you would say that's not the case, then you've created a, your own God. That God couldn't send anybody to hell because he doesn't exist. So, if we have wrong thoughts about God, that's still idolatry. Um, A.W. Tozer had this to say in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. It's kind of deep. By what we think of God, our knowledge of him, Everything else spills forth out of that. We've been talking in our worldview class about we may profess to have one worldview, but we may live another. The worldview we hold to is the one we actually live out. If we say something and we don't act like we believe it, then we don't really believe it. If I don't trust that God's my security and my provider, and I refrain from giving, I'm not believing God's going to provide. I have a wrong thought about God. And that shapes how I act. So our focus on truth is very important. If we know God, though, everything that we can do can be an act of worship. 1 Corinthians 10.31. You're welcome to flip there, but I've got it part of it here. As Paul cautions believers not to consume meat offered to idols for the sake of another person's conscience in this passage, he says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. No matter what's going on, it's to bring him glory. He's talking specifically here that do not offend somebody else's conscience by consuming meat that's offered to idols, if that knowledge is made known. 
there's freedom in that Paul could have consumed that. The people Paul's talking to could have. But if it gave somebody else a wrong idea of God, that wouldn't have brought him glory. So Paul was willing to be submissive so that God would receive glory. But in any action, whether it's eating, whether it's fellowship, whatever you're doing, God can still be glorified. We're told to work as if under the Lord in our, in our jobs that we do. If I'm not mistaken, that's in Proverbs. That everything we do is to bring Him glory. We work as if working under the Lord. Um, interesting follow-up on that. There was a, a 17th century French monk named Brother Lawrence who stated that he could worship God as much in doing the dishes at the monastery as he could while partaking of the sacrament of communion. That in everything, his mindset could be focused on God and bringing him glory. Paul further widens that scope put forth in 1 Corinthians 10.31 in Romans Verse tw or chapter 12, verse 1. You've heard this verse before, I'm sure, several times. He states, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Does that mean you go lay your body on an altar and say, Here, God, I am? Literally. No. Metaphorically, yes. That means you're not withholding anything. I will let you have this time slot of my life, God, but not this over here. I have this activity I like to do. I, I have this area where I want to focus my time that I'd really not like to, to focus on you. That's not giving everything. That's holding back. I have something somebody else in the church needs that I don't. If I can't bear myself to part with it. That's not being worshipful. But if we give, that is. I mean, the example of Abraham leaves all of us coming up a little bit short. <laughs> but Abraham was a human just as we are. He wasn't Christ. But it's easy to forget that he wasn't endowed with some supernatural power. Um, earlier in Romans, Paul also addresses this a little bit. In um, chapter 6, verse 13, he says, Do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Does an instrument or a tool control itself? No. It's laying yourself down and letting God use you for his purposes and his glory. For you literally to become his hands and feet. When it says members, that's what it means. That you're going forth, you're doing the work of God as he leads. Now, we've discussed some of the mindset of worship. Why should we worship? He's worthy, and we're created for him. Colossians 1, if y'all want to flip here, this will be six verses. Colossians 1, 15 through 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him in all things were created, in heaven and on earth, Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the, from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Everything is for God, including us. If you look in that passage, the number of times that all is used, at least in the ESV translation, three, four, five, six, 
six, seven times all is mentioned. That's encompassing everything is for God. It's easy for us to forget that sometimes and live for ourselves in our own glory. And I'm preaching just as much to me as I am to anybody else. Secondly, why should we worship? Because there are times mentioned in Scripture when worship is commanded. And we'll mention that in a little bit. The next point, worship is a dialogue. We're gathered here. We're two or more are God is in the midst, right? We have the Holy Spirit dwelling with us. But when we come together corporately, God is here. We know that. We come in, usually we open with a song of praise. We're acknowledging, we're greeting, we're praising. Sometimes the word is even proclaimed through song. Then we have either the reading of the passage and then the scripture where God is speaking through his word to us. Then we respond sometimes in song after the message, but our response should also be in obedience and living out a lifestyle of worship by submitting ourselves. So worship is a dialogue. He reveals himself, we respond. He reveals himself, we respond. It's a continual dialogue. He breathes out, we breathe in, we return. We give back. Okay? Isaiah 6 is an excellent illustration of this. Verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And he called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. God revealed a little bit of himself. Isaiah was forced to respond. Continuing, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? God speaks. Literally in this case. Isaiah responds, Here I am, send me. God reveals, man responds. God reveals, man responds. That dialogue is part of worship. Now, in worship dialogue, there's a couple of things to remember. There are two mindsets of God, and you see these outlined here. Transcendence. This is that God is bigger than us, above us, larger than us, which he is. Isaiah 40. Isaiah is such an awesome book. I cannot imagine what it was like to be Isaiah. God is speaking through his prophet in this passage, Isaiah 40, 12 through 26, when he says, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and marked off the heavens with a span, and closed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the Spirit of the Lord? Or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult, and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as a dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dusts. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing in emptiness. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness compare with him? An idol? A craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts it for silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will rot. He seeks out a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? 
It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in? Who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness? Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? Meaning the stars. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his mind. And because he is strong in power, not one is missing. That makes us feel about that small when we look at the scope of how big God is. If he had left us there, we'd be doomed. One of my favorite phrases that David says from time to time is that God condescended to us. Descend, came down, con, with lowered himself through the person of Jesus Christ to be with us. That's what eminence is. The next portion of your outline. Matthew 1.23 says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Same root from where we get the word eminent. And John 1.14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. The glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. But they're both sides of the same coin. If God was only on our level, we had no hope for him to save us because he couldn't do anything. God was so far above us he wouldn't do anything but he chose even though he's above us to dwell with us to bring us back into his presence I'd say that's pretty worthy of our worship and in that our response to him should be genuine and truth it shouldn't be trite or flippant Another Isaiah reference in Isaiah 29, 13. This is an example of not how to be. We should not be, as he describes here about Israel when he says, This people draw near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me. And their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. They don't have a personal knowledge of God. They've adopted what they've heard. They fear God because they're afraid only and have no conception of his love. They don't have a right idea of God, and therefore they're disobedient. I know there's times that people could look at my life and say the same thing, and that breaks my heart. But I don't want that to be the case. I don't want to say I love him and not show it. That's a tough challenge. That means everything that we do has to be filtered through the lens of the gospel. Whether or not it's bringing glory to Christ. How should we respond then in our dialogue of worship? We should instead respond... As Jesus told the woman at the well, he would be worshipped. Their dialogue is in John 4, 19-24. He knows her sin. He knows who she is. Oh, excuse me, that's a mixed metaphor, I'm sorry. Two women. But he's talking to this person who has been a Samaritan. She said, we've been told we worship 
here. Yeah, this is where our fathers worship. Yeah, the Jews say we must worship in Jerusalem. Which is right. He responds. Woman, believe me. The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship not what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Salvation comes from the Jews. God the Father revealed himself to his chosen people. Through the Jewish line came Christ, who redeemed the nations. You see in this passage all three members of the Trinity, and that they'll receive worship. God is worship. God is spirit, referencing the Holy Spirit. And truth is Christ, because he says in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We must worship through a right knowledge, through the person and work of Christ, in the power of the Spirit. We're indwelt with the Spirit at salvation. He guides us into truth. And through our obedience, we bring glory to the Father. Why else should we worship? Worship is also a privilege. Those who know God through the person and work of Jesus Christ can worship Him now and join in with the worship that's already taking place in heaven. We don't have to wait till the day that every knee will bow when He brings into submission those who have been disobedient. In Philippians 2, 9-11, Therefore God has exalted Him and bestowed on Him every name, the name that is above every name, so with the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, and in heaven and on earth and on under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. We also don't have to wait until the time we enter heaven. In Revelation 7, I won't recount the whole thing, but there's a beautiful picture of what Piper mentioned earlier, the ultimate goal being worship. People from every tribe, people group, language, nation will all be standing before the throne and before Jesus Christ worshiping, crying out salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb. We can still give him that praise now. We don't have to wait till then. Okay, so how does this work itself out practically? Our modes of worship. Individual worship. We have to be thinking rightly about God and bringing Him glory in all we do. That doesn't mean we have to sing songs as we drive around. If we're led to do so, that's fine. As long as we're being mindful of what we're singing. Family. Leaders leading your household in right thoughts about God. Discussing the word, even singing together if you feel comfortable. But individual worship has to come before the next one, before corporate worship. A couple of mindsets, and I'm thankful that we don't seem to have this mindset here at ABF. So many times, corporate worship gets treated like a supermarket. We go in and see what we can get to get us through the week. I ran out of this. My supply is running a little low. Let me pick up a little more. I need a little more grace this week. I need a little more mercy today. I... That almost seems like what we do. What's wrong with that mindset? Because God is the giver of all things. He wants to bestow gifts upon his children. Okay? That's true. But worship is for God. That would be like me going into a friend's birthday party, not bringing you a gift and saying, Happy birthday, man, what'd you get me? Nice. 
Am I honoring the person whose birthday it is? Am I honoring the host, the person who's supposed to receive all the recognition and all the praise that day? I'm taking from him. How dare I do that? But God is gracious that when we give to Him and we recognize Him, He pours it back undeservingly on us. Hebrews 20, uh, 10, 23 through 25. I heard the last part of this taken so often as a legalistic command. I heard the King James translation, nothing against that translation, but this phrase stuck in my head. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. I just heard that as the command. You need to be in church because the Bible says, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Then I read it in name context. Three verses make a huge difference, difference here. 23 through 25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who is promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together as is in the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. As we gather, we have the opportunity to minister to each other and to be encouraged by each other. It's amazing how God works that out. Something for Him. And if we come and give for Him, He gives back. But if we come in taking, have we really gotten anything anyway? Okay. Next portion. Focusing it back a little bit more on spoken praise here. Directions of worship. Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. Let me, let me not read the whole passage here. You can go back and read that in context. But um, let me pick up at 18. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. I, I'm, this is not getting legalistic about alcohol. We're not going there. Okay? That's not the point. The point it said there was don't, don't be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. We're focusing on something else other than God getting to the next part of the sentence. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Addressing one another. Okay, note that. Singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Two directions mentioned there. Let's look at the vertical one first where it says singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. That's one aspect. That worship is a dialogue. We've already discussed that. We dialogue and correspond with God. We have a conversation in our worship with Him. But also, there's a horizontal aspect. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We sang two songs this morning. Here I am to worship. Light of the world, you stepped down into darkness. Humbly, you came. We're directly addressing God in that song in the person of Jesus Christ. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. We're saying that to each other, encouraging one another. That we're in submission, we're worshiping, we're giving everything we have. So right there, and that was totally unplanned. I love how God works things out. We have two examples right there of those different modes. Okay? I would say it's not good to lean totally on horizontal. You have to have the vertical. I would err on the side of having more vertical than horizontal in a worship service. But at the same time, it's not a sin to have songs where God is not the direct subject and where we're encouraged. It took me a long time to accept that. It was born out in Scripture here, right in front of my face. Because it's so easy to focus on me, God, and leave out we, God. 
when we're singing and we lose ourselves in our little world. Okay. Now, how do we worship? We said it earlier, Romans 12, 1, everything we do is worship. Okay, got that down. So that means every part of our lives, but that also means every part of the service. That means from our coming in, that means from our fellowshipping with one another, that means from the word being proclaimed through reading, through preaching, it's an act of worship. When we take communion, that's an act of worship. Baptism is an act of worship. Singing praise is an act of worship, but it's not the only act of worship in the church. Giving is an act of worship. If we're talking about being a living sacrifice, yet we're holding back as, as Mount... You know, yeah, I'm going Old Testament here for a second. I'm not going to tell you about the tithe, etc., but with the point when we hold back from God and don't give, we're essentially robbing Him. We shouldn't give out of a guilty conscience. We should be cheerful and thankful because God has given so much to us. So everything we do. But now specifically in singing. In the Old Testament, I looked in the ESV translation for the phrase, Sing to the Lord as commanded. 25 times in Psalms. Okay, and there are several other phrases other than that one that sing unto hymns, etc. But there's a pretty clear case from Psalms that we're to sing unto God. Right? 25 times for that one phrase makes a pretty strong argument for me. Okay? So there's an Old Testament command to sing. New Testament, we've discussed two already. Ephesians 5. Okay? We've mentioned that one. Singing to one another. Singing and making melody to the Lord. Colossians 3, 16 and 17. Paul says here, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. I don't see an if or if you feel like it or, or any other condition there. I see that this is a commandment to the church at Colossae, which was a body of the Christ which is given in his word to us and is an example of how we should worship in the body of Christ. So we're told with singing to worship. Now, does that mean everybody's vocal phrase is going to be perfect? Does that mean we all sound like angels and, and have immaculate voices? No, because I don't. I don't. There are times my voice cracks, etc. But even if you're not on pitch, that doesn't mean you can't sing. God gives us a voice, gives us the opportunity to use it. If we're focused more on what the people around us sound like, we're not giving God our worship anyway. If we're too concerned about what we're sounding like, we're holding back and we're not offering everything we have to God. Yeah. Now, why singing? God rejoices over us with singing. Zephaniah 317. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love, and he will exult over you with loud singing. The creator of everything sings over us, yet we don't want to sing to him. How? How can we not respond in kind to him. Now, what should we sing? What should be the subject of our singing? Well, if you look back at Colossians 3, 16 and 17, start of verse 16, all of this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. That the word of Christ is the focus there in the teaching and singing. Now, this next part I found when I was studying for the sermon is by a guy named Bob Coughlin who wrote an excellent text called Worship Matters. Um, singing serves the word by there are three points here. First, it helps us remember words. There's been statistics that I have seen. 
I've seen 60%, I've seen 70%, I couldn't find the root of it, so I'm not going to give you the source and misquote a statistic. But regardless, the songs we sing in worship shape our theology of God, right? If everything we sang this morning was orthodox, we fall down. A vision of what we'll do in Revelation when we cast the crowns God's given us back to his feet. The beginning of Here I Am to Worship, John 1. The light of the world stepped down and joined us. Okay? There's nothing there unscriptural. I may step on some toes here. This song I have sung before. I have led before. You probably know where I'm going. Like a rose trampled on the ground, you took the fall and thought of me above all. If Jesus Christ put us above God the Father in his obedience on the cross, something's wrong. The goal of us being redeemed was to bring glory to God the Father. Amen. So if we sing that song and we get that mindset in our heads, we've made an idol of ourselves. We must sing truths in our worship. Some of the songs I have led may be a little heavier than you hear in most churches. But I promise you, I'll do my best to make sure they're from the Word. Because I don't want to be held accountable of leading you astray. And the head must lead the heart. It must not be the other way around. Amen. The emotions don't get the first round and then the head follows. Because that can lead to some scary places. We have to think about what's going on. God tells us that our hearts are deceitfully wicked above all things. That's pretty harsh. If we trust our own hearts more than we trust the truths here, we're trusting in the wrong thing. This guides us. The Spirit through this guides us. Not what I feel that that I feel in my heart that we should do this. You better check that. God revealed to me through his word that we're not doing this the right way. He's not receiving glory through this. Let's talk about it then. Now, secondly, helping us in, it, singing helps us engage the words emotionally. It's so easy to come in with, there are some churches I've seen that say, Celebratory worship every Sunday. Do we feel like rejoicing every single Sunday? Is celebrating the only emotional response we're allowed to give to God? Look at Psalms. Look at how many times David cries out, questions God, is even angry with God. Does that mean we should come into our worship angry with God in our praise? No, not necessarily, but reality, we may be struggling with that. And we're not going to feel like singing something celebratory. Amen. Okay? What if we need to repent of something? It's hard to repent when we're singing celebrate. Jesus, celebrate. There's a song called... Um, Knowing You by a guy named Graham Kendrick that has a lot of beautiful lyrics. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all. You're the best. That line just kind of brings it down. There are times that we need to focus on reverence of God and who He is. There are times that we express joy in Him. There are times that we express love. All these different aspects, it can't be limited to just one. But we shouldn't shortchange one with something else. 
there are times we're hurting, and we need to address that in our worship. We don't need to ignore that emotion. David didn't. It's okay to not be happy. It's okay to let God know our difficulties. It's okay to say, God, I'm having a really difficult time handling this. And one of my favorite songs of worship, very short, it's called Rescue. The chorus is just, I need you, Jesus, to come to my rescue. Where else could I go? There's times we need that. Yeah. Lastly, singing serves the word by helping us use words to demonstrate and express our unity. When we sing songs that talk about us, we, the church, we're showing that we are all together unified as the body of Christ. Songs should be used to unite the church rather than divide it. They should be both relevant and reverent. In other words, I shouldn't pull out something in Latin that has no relevance to us. Um, I'm trying to actually think of part of the Mass that I've sung in Latin before. There's, you've probably heard this in some churches, Glory be to the Father and to the Son, so on. The Latin of that is the Gloria Patri that is used in some churches. It's part of the first movement of the Latin Mass. But it would be really weird for us to bring that in in Latin and try to sing it because it would have no relevance to us. Okay? Or if we're singing a song that was written by a church in the 1800s in a frontier environment and uses language that we're not familiar with and we can't express our feelings to God through that because that's not part of our culture and our society. It has to be relevant to us to be able to express adequately, adequately to God our affections and our feelings for Him. But that shouldn't shortchange reverence. We should never exchange the worthiness of God to put it in cool contemporary language just because we can. I have an issue with taking a lot of secular songs and altering one or two lyrics just to make them a worship song because that was not the intent in which they were given to be composed. Sometimes in a similar style, sometimes in a similar sound, may be acceptable depending on the context, but not the same stuff, just tweaking it a little bit. Um, also, if I were to get up here and while I'm leading worship, just bust out a huge face-melting guitar solo, okay? And you think, Man, he can play, which is never going to happen because I can't play like that. But the point there is, if you think, man, what a good job. Who just received the glory during that phrase or that portion? I did. I was trying to seal it through my play. If distractions aren't removed from worship and cause your attention to be diverted, that could be removed. That short changes the focus on God. So, the errors, musical errors, if I mess up a chord and you're listening along and you're like, oh, that didn't sound right, that just interrupted me worshiping, one, you shouldn't be listening that hard anyway. I'm joking. But, seriously, if, if I haven't prepared well enough or whoever leads you in worship hasn't prepared well enough that I'm flubbing up and causing you to be distracted, that's on me. I'm causing your attention to be, to be pulled from God. You should strive to keep worship to Him in spite of it, but I should remove as many stumbling blocks as possible. We shouldn't do things just because we can. Because that's stealing our focus and worship from Him. Making an idol of style does not unite the church. When you have churches that have split into two or three different services, are over contemporary, traditional. Instead of saying worship, you put the adjective before the verb of what should be done, putting that higher. You just put that higher than Christ. You've made an idol of style if you've done that. There's one church I know in Atlanta, they have six services. 
three set or two sets of three that the, the pastor preaches. It's a simulcast, two locations on the same campus. They sing them, but the worship is synced up in both. One of them traditional hymns, choir, orchestra, the other one, rock band, etc. And even the last of the rock band tent is like major heavy, major, even more heavy. So they have three different styles, and they're grouping their people coming in by style. So you're formatting and segmenting the body into six smaller bodies of Christ instead of one united whole. Those people in that early traditional service have no clue who those people in that late contemporary service are. You can't minister to them. Because of the wrong emphasis placed on worship. Now, closing out, that was starting from this last portion, what worship is not. Worship through music is not using music to attract others into the body of Christ. We don't say to others, hey, come hear the cool band we've got. Because we don't have a band. But even if we did, we wouldn't say, come hear the cool band we've got. Hey, come worship Jesus with us. Amen. We're to lift up the sun, not music about the sun. John 12, 32. And I, when I am lifted up on the earth, will draw all people to myself. What else should we not do with music and worship? We shouldn't use it to emotionally manipulate people into anything. It is to allow you to express your emotions in worship through God. It's not to make you feel emotionally a certain way. We should minister to you in knowing what's going on and knowing who's hurting and provide those opportunities for you to give praise in that form when needed. We're to be able to, we should know what's going on when there are, there is absolute rejoicing going on in the body. So we're able to prepare in that direction and minister to you there. We're to help you vocalize through musical worship the feelings you have been led by your head and spirit to have about God at that point in time. Not to make you feel this way. Not to force you into feeling guilty about something for which you should not feel guilty. And forcing you to not feel guilty about something you should feel guilty. Amen. If you need you're convicted and you need the opportunity to repent and I bust out with something celebratory as mentioned earlier, I'm doing you a disservice. And more importantly, I'm depriving God of worship and not giving you the opportunity to give that to Him. But you have to be obedient in giving that to Him when you have the opportunity. If we do use music in that way, that's blasphemy by assuming the role of the Holy Spirit. We're saying, we're God. We're going to control how other people feel and respond. When that's God's job. As we learn through the doctrines of grace. John 6.44 told us, No one can come unto me unless the Father who sent me draws him. We don't draw we don't drag our friends and neighbors to the cross. We profess Christ. And when that word is made known, the Holy Spirit, the Father through the Holy Spirit, drags them to the cross. That's not our job. That's not our job to other people either. I've been in churches sometimes when an invitation is going on forever. And... And somebody will try to grab somebody else that they think needs Christ and bring them down. If that person is not willing to come for Christ on their own, they're not responding to Christ at that moment in time. They're not seeing who He is. That may be, may be kind of harsh, but... I, I, I don't see that in, in Scripture. I don't see where Paul or any of the other apostles went around dragging people to the cross. I see people hearing the word and coming to them and what must we do to be saved? You know, households coming before hearing the word of Christ and responding. 
Yes, friends may have brought friends to the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, good. The word's been heard. Okay? But that doesn't mean they forced him to realize this is the Savior. God has to reveal that himself. It's a lot to digest this morning, I know. It was a lot for me to be led to prepare. I apologize for the length, but not for the content. If there's parts where we've zoned out and took myself, no, I'm joking. You can go back, this will be online, and peruse it. But keeping our affections on God in spirit and truth and obedience, not being led by emotion, not seeking for us, but seeking to give Him glory is the heart of worship. Father, we thank you for revealing yourself this morning. We know you're here. We know that your spirit dwells in each one of us. God, I pray that you would forgive me when I live contrary to putting you first in all things. When I temporary think of myself more than anything. God, and help us to realize that even if our obedience may seem inconvenient at times, that there may be things we might enjoy doing, but that would not bring you glory. In the end, it's for our good. Everything works good to those who love the Lord. God, in one day, as we praise you in eternity, as if you haven't given us enough already, we'll never be one that ultimately our refusing to do some things because of bringing glory to you is not an act of self-denial for self-denial's sake God but that you pour out your affections back on us help us to keep you first help us to see you in love in truth to not only fear you, God. To offer every part of us to you. When we're hurting, when we have things we're struggling with, God, help us to bring them to you. When we rejoice, God, help us to bring you glory for what you've done. Help us to have a continual worship dialogue. Thank you.